Got it. Okay. Uh, and so all things, uh, all this to say that regardless of whether we are talking about um, carbon taxes, loss and damage, degrowth, or any other sort of policy lever that one can imagine, those policy levers will only be successful to the, to the extent that they are percolating through this entire system. And this is why interdisciplinarity and particularly collaborative research is so important because if we're only focusing on one portion of this system uh, in guiding our policy uh, options, then they're not likely to be successful. Now, most of my work is down here in this bottom layer uh, in human behavior. And I want to delve in particular uh, into emotions because emotions, um, as uh, I will share with you today, are a driving force in all of those uh, human behaviors uh, that, I just, um, that I just discussed. So what are emotions and why do they matter? So first of all, just a little bit of definitional uh, clarification. Feelings covers a lot of different phenomena. These terms themselves, feeling, feelings, affect, and emotions, uh, these are also subjective and culturally so. There are different languages that don't even have some of these terms. Uh, but by and large, if you read uh, um, psychological sciences uh, and neurosciences, they distinguish between affect, which describes basic biophysical responses, which we may or may not even be aware of, uh, from emotions, which are uh, basically our responses to stimuli that we are conscious of. Importantly, uh, I think are, are the la most importantly are the last two points here. And that is, first of all, that humans express several types of emotions, some of which, in fact, many of which are uh, particularly unique to our own species. There's a whole rich literature on the evolution of emotions that's just fascinating. And of course, we don't have enough time to, to delve into it here, um, but I certainly encourage you to do those. So for those of you who are interested, and then most importantly, uh, all of our decisions and actions start with emotions, despite the fact that we still have a tendency within the academy and certainly beyond the academy to presume that uh, cognition and emotions are separate um, and that uh, emotions, in a sense, distort decision making when, in fact, emotions are absolutely key to decision making. So in short, this is what uh, emotion action pathways look like. So we each as individuals are exposed to uh, more stimuli every day than we have uh, the, the, the capacity to, to process mentally. So what we do is um, when we receive those stimuli, those stimuli go through our basically our affective filters and certain stimuli are selected for our attention over others. They tend to be stimuli that either represent some kind of opportunity or maybe some kind of threat that we have become uh, perhaps familiar with throughout our own personal history, or perhaps it's the very novelty of what we're being exposed to that uh, we determine is an opportunity or a threat. But then that appraisal process is shaped by our social relations, by our groups, by our, by our information networks. And it is only after that, uh, basically that issue, whether it's climate change or um, whether or not to have children, um, uh, it, that is when actions are chosen. And then ultimately our actions have outcomes for social change. So emotions basically sit at the basis of this whole sequence and, um, and it's also fundamental to understanding social change. Okay, so what makes us tick? Um, so there's now a huge body of, of, of uh, research on uh, neurology and, and sociology of human emotions. But if you don't have the time or the interest to do a sabbatical and, and, and read up on, on uh, emotions research, I would say that there's one simple rule that says a lot and it's worth uh, putting a pin in. That's basically the fact that we are generally speaking attracted to positive emotions and we see, <clears throat> excuse me, and we seek to avoid negative emotions. Each of these emotions theoretically emerged at some point in our evolutionary history because they either rewarded or sanctioned behaviors that were associated with survival or 
quote unquote, uh, fitness, fitness in some way. Of course, this doesn't mean that they always support fitness. And it doesn't mean that we always form social structures uh, that are in accordance with these predispositions either. In fact, um, social systems in which egalitarianism and equity prevail on the whole are associated with lower levels of negative emotions. And it, this in turn enhances solidarity and cooperation and collective problem solving. The opposite also seems to be true. And we have plenty of examples uh, of social systems uh, with those characteristics. Okay, so let's dive in a little bit more and talk about um, what makes us feel good and what makes us feel bad. So what makes us feel good? Well, certainly loving and being loved, finding mutual care in relationships, feels good. Group belonging also feels awesome. And then closely related to this is identity validation. So confirmation of who I am, my self-representation. So if you're in this crowd, if you have your, your Make America Great Again hat on, you're in. If you're carrying a Biden flag, then you're probably not going to make it. Um, also closely related to this is sharing emotions. So Durkheim called this, Emil Durkheim that is, uh, called this a collective effervescence, but I think sharing emotions works just fine. Uh, so why do we go to the stadium? Why do we do things like attend parades? Why do national, uh, national anthems um, work so effectively to generate patriotism? Well, it's because we love it. We love to be able to recognize that what we're feeling is shared. Uh, and it also draws us together. It also just so happens, feels good to give. There's been extensive empirical research uh, which shows that, that giving actually feels good. And it particularly makes us feel good if someone else is watching um, because of course that improves our reputation as well. We also like being treated fairly and this in turn generates trust in our relationships. So every parent knows that uh, children learn what's fair and what's not fair even before they know how to express it. And then finally, we like to feel like we are in control of ourselves. We like to feel like we have efficacy or feel empowered. Um, we like to have the sense that we're the masters of our own def uh, f destiny. That's basically what, so what efficacy is all about. On the other hand, the things that make us feel bad are pretty much the flip side of everything that I just shared on the previous slide. So loneliness um, certainly uh, makes us feel bad. And in fact, you know, we could view loneliness similar to hunger. It's basically, it's a trigger that suggests that we're, we have an unmet need. Um, so loneliness is about not belonging to a group or not having close relationships, identity invalidation uh, is also in a sense, uh, a means of basically being shunned from a, book, from a group. It's being told that uh, who you are doesn't fit, isn't okay. So racism, for example, is one of the most acute forms of identity invalidation, but subtler forms of identity invalidation come up in all of our social interactions, like not being up to speed on proper etiquette, in a given situation, for example, or wearing an outfit that's out of fashion. These can be the premise for identity invalidation. And then of course, being treated unfairly doesn't feel good. Feeling fear and distrust. And then finally, powerlessness as well. Powerlessness, uh, uh, the, the fact that powerlessness uh, doesn't feel good, in fact, is, a, is one of the good reasons why dictatorships are so unstable. So social systems that allow for at least some level of autonomy are more likely to be stable because people are more likely to feel empowered. Uh, and this is why, one of the reasons why equitable and egalitarian systems appear to be more stable because they support fairness and efficacy. So, these negative emotions are, of course, part of life. Um, uh, but if we have opportunities to, to basically avoid them, we will. 
And for those individuals and in those social systems in which sitting in negative emotions uh, or avoiding negative e emotions uh, is not possible, um, this can lead to serious mental health problems, um, as we all know. Okay. So I wanna take a closer look at a couple of what I think are some key emotions um, that, that have everything to do with group belonging, uh, you'll, you'll see, uh, but they're also particularly important in this case to our response to climate change. So I wanna start with some negative emotions. Uh, these are of course uh, associated with uh, those feelings of, of identity invalidation uh, or not feeling like one belongs in a group. So shame and guilt, um, which tend to um, be confused as uh, you know, very very similar phenomena. They 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 are at least conceptually very different. So when we violate moral norms, we experience guilt. When we behave in ways that are perceived to be culturally incompetent, and this could even include who we are, such as someone who is of darker skin, someone who is a lesbian, someone who is indigenous, uh, then we can be uh, made to feel shame in certain, uh, in certain situations as well. Okay. Now let's take a look at pride. So given how awful negative emotions feel like shame and, and guilt, uh, they are nonetheless um, considered uh, to be very useful emotions in basically sanctioning behaviors, keeping cultural rules intact, uh, maintaining group norms. But if we only had the, those negative emotions to rely on to keep our groups together, then uh, our groups wouldn't be too, uh, too stable because we would all just get tired of, of, of uh, feeling lousy all the time and our communities would ultimately break down. But there's a flip side to shame and guilt and, and that's basically pride. So pride is about positive evaluation by others, which we get when we do things that are recognized as worthy and in accordance with cultural norms. So if you're in uh, an egalitarian society, but even in other, in, in, in other cultural contexts as well, um, oftentimes the kinds of behaviors that are rewarded are altruistic behaviors, are all about giving. We're in fact incapable of, in, of extraordinary acts of, of altruism in part due to the role of pride. So think about going to war or entering a, a burning building to save someone's life. These acts not only feel good, but they also enhance your reputation in the community. And that in turn could enhance your own prospects. Uh, building social capital, maybe you're more likely to get that promotion. So pride also has uh, you know, an important role to play uh, for individuals and for groups. But pride, just like shame and guilt, also can cut in both ways. Because it is so closely linked to uh, culturally prescribed norms, we get basically distorted operations or, or, or applications of pride. So big boys don't cry. Women are rewarded for being perfect mothers far more often than they are for being uh, great CEOs. Actions considered worthy of reward can also become uh, highly distorted. So particularly in siloed cultural contexts, like, I, I don't know, attacking the capital to impress your commander in chief. Okay. The last particular emotion I want to focus on is empathy. And this one's a little bit more complicated uh, than the other ones that uh, we've been talking about, because it kind of comes in three parts. First of all, it encompasses a cognitive element, the cognitive capacity to take the perspective of another, basically to walk in another's shoes. But it, and then it also has the, the affective capacity to feel what another feels, sometimes automatically. So if you flinch because you see somebody else tripping on the sidewalk, that's uh, basically an element of empathy. But it also has the emotional capacity includes the emotional capacity to care about what happened to that person who just tripped on the sidewalk. And it is this third element that's particularly important to being motivated uh, to, to, to act on, on that empathy. It's also important to note, however, that the first one, that cognitive capacity to walk in another's shoes, is the only one of these three that is actually, uh, you know, very much a learned or a cultivated behavior. The other two seem to be very closely associated with, with inherited traits. 
So because of that, our predispositions for empathy vary quite a bit. It's also important to note that empathy is invoked in social interaction, and that's enhanced when similarities are perceived. But the good news is, uh, and work by, sorry, my computer is updating or something here. Um, it's particularly work by, by Arlie Hochschild has, has shown that we have the capacity to, to basically expand our empathy maps. So as much as empathy um, tends to be limited to expression to our in-groups, people who look like us, people who share our values, people who share our language, um, we do have the capacity to basically take the perspective of others beyond our in-groups uh, and essentially expand our empathy maps. And that includes to the non-human world. So caring for others generates positive emotions, um, but it's also important to note that uh, empathy also takes effort. So this is why, and particularly in busy, stressful lives, we tend uh, perhaps not to be as uh, empathic uh, as we might otherwise be inclined to be. And if we don't feel, uh, also if we don't feel able to respond to our concern, then we might be, uh, meaning that if we're lacking efficacy to do something about it, then we might be inclined to just turn away rather than uh, seek to, to, to help those in need. I lost my... There we go. Okay, so given all that I just laid out in terms of how uh, emotions work and how they work differently, uh, this is uh, you know a great place to intervene and say uh, and 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 discuss the extent to which intersectionality really matters here. So we each uh, basically occupy different positions within social structures. We all belong to different groups, and so given the extent to which our group belonging um, is, uh, is an important part of, um, pardon me, uh, of how, our, uh, how we feel emotions and what we react to, um, then uh, it, it makes perfect sense then that our structural positionality is going to matter a lot. And in fact, there's a lot of research that, that shows just this. Um, and there are a couple of, I think, per, per, uh, important things to consider here. Um, first of all, um, it is the fact that marginalized groups end up doing far more emotion management than others based on basically their, their, their subliminal position uh, within social hierarchies. And the experience of multiple sources of distress taxes coping skills. And so for those groups who are in a marginalized position, who so are more likely to experience forms of distress um, or, 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 or uh, stressful events, uh, then their, their emotion coping capacities are going to suffer as a result. And efficacy and distrust also interact with our emotional responses. So for those groups who have very good reasons to be distrustful of others uh, and for whom, uh, based on previous experience, uh, uh, have a feelings of, of, of disempowerment, that's also going to affect their emotionality and their emotional responses to the world around them, including to climate change. Okay, so just a brief synthesis here. Uh, we need emotions. They facilitate learning and memory. Um, they're the in initiation of our uh, deliberation and decision-making. And so basically they are the starting point of our personal and our collective action projects. Um, but emotions are also double-edged. Our emotional predispositions uh, basically uh, can be uh, as dysfunctional as they can be functional uh, for, for our social systems. And we can and have built social structures that work against us, that effectively bring out our worst rather than bringing out our best. So cultural, or sorry, uh, uh, cultural and social structures that support inequity and dominance, for example, um, what we're effectively doing is rewarding our alphas and punishing our egalitarians in these systems. And then, of course, there's social media, uh, and we don't have time to 
um, to, eat, to, 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 to delve too far into that, but, but the role of social media and its tendency to, to, to basically further silo our in-groups and out-groups uh, and prevent opportunities for even shared emotions across those groups uh, has been um, you know, enormously uh, detrimental. But emotions are fundamentally social phenomena. Most researchers who study emotions understand this, but too often uh, the unit of analysis still remains the individual. And to understand how emotions are linked, we need to attend to flows of information, the triggers, sociocultural context, and including a particular positionality, uh, which was uh, as we just discussed. So let's take all that now and apply it to climate change. So how are emotions involved then in our social responses to climate change? Well, first we need to talk about what's the emotion trigger? What's the stimulus that gets that whole emotion cognition pathway uh, started? What does this involve? Well, should involve fear. It's okay to be scared. Um, so what we need in order to uh, basically respond to climate change, first and foremost, is recognition that climate change poses a clear and present danger to our lives, livelihoods, ecosystems, and other things that we value. So that's kind of challenge number one. But next, climate change is quintessentially a collective action problem. So no one's gonna fix this on their own. And ideally then, we want emotional responses that support cooperation, guided by expansive empathy maps. This becomes a very big challenge number two. And the emotions involved here, as we've been discussing, are by no means simple or predetermined. So what's the trigger then? So we're hardwired generally to, to respond to clear and present dangers, like the bear on the trail. All of our attention becomes laser focused on that threat and survival instincts kick in. But for the vast majority of us, unless you're a climate scientist, global warming doesn't appear in the form of a bear on the trail. It comes in the form of information. Even extreme events uh, that are experienced personally need to be compellingly attributed to climate change through information for us to see that connection. So because the trigger takes the form of secondary information uh, for the vast majority of us, all sorts of opportunities to miss or misinterpret that signal emerge linked to the, all of the stuff that we've basically been talking about. Do I trust the source? Uh, is the source a member of my out group? What are the people in my in group saying about this? Did they scoff when I brought it up? Am I receiving consistent messages? And can I draw causal links to the threat and the things that are important to me? And here's an important one. Do I understand the language of the method? Or the, sorry, the message, which is often in the form of that, that last bubble down there, science. So this graph may scare a scientist who understands its implications, but for most of us, that's just a squiggly line. In other words, there's a lot of noise here to get in the way of an appropriate threat response. Nonetheless, more and more of us are, of course, recognizing the threat of climate change and responding accordingly. And if we imagine all of the different ways we can respond to climate change, there's the first one, which is basically people who fail to, to, to recognize the threat in and of itself. And then of course there's denial, plenty of research on this. And then there's also withdrawal. So acknowledging uh, the threat of climate change but feeling in, in, unable to, to basically respond to it. So all of these are basically emotion cognition pathways that favor inaction. And then on the other hand, we have those emotion cognition pathways that favor action. So I wanna just take a sort of a conceptual look at what each of these looks like uh, and informed by uh, empirical research to the extent that, that we have uh, that empirical research um, record to date. So apathy, no emotion trigger at all here. Climate information is just not marked for deliberation. And this is true for many people. Climate change remains an abstract concept with many ambiguities. There are too many other things that are higher up on the headline list these days 
Um, and so it's easy to, to basically step away from the newsfeed uh, that tells us about climate change, particularly when many of us are preoccupied or stressed about other stuff anyway. Now, of course, research suggests that climate change apathy is on the decline, finally, but uh, that, of course, can, uh, can change with uh, uh, changes in the news. Okay, so what about denial? So the distinction between denial and apathy might be difficult to observe, but the difference is substantial. Apathy describes a lack of concern. Denial describes a lack of matters of acute concern. And it's a valuable coping mechanism for, for, for many of us uh, that we invoke when we detect sim stimuli that are just too overwhelming. And in such cases, if climate change is considered too overwhelming, then we might be inclined to grasp onto alternative storylines, including conspiracy theories, to reestablish a sense of security and stability in our lives. Deniers, of course, have received a lot of attention in environmental sociology. Um, but let's clarify what we're talking about here. Uh, there are certainly a uh, small handful of hardcore deniers who deny uh, uh, that, that global warming is occurring. They, they, they basically deny the science of climate change as a whole. Um, but there's a, a much larger proportion of us um, for whom uh, we engage in maybe softer forms of denial. So we accept the science of climate change. Um, but um, we insist that it's going to be all right, that solutions will emerge, um, maybe from technology um, or maybe just human progress uh, narratives that convince us uh, of that. So let's dig a little deeper into just what exactly is being rejected and what can vary, uh, which can vary, pardon me. And for some, what may be overwhelming here is not the threat of, that climate change poses uh, to us, but the threats that acknowledgement of climate change poses. In other words, the consequences of climate action for the distribution of power and wealth. And um, the consequences, not only for the distribution of power and wealth, but also for uh, different lives and livelihoods and cultural beliefs. Okay. Third is withdrawal. So the trigger's been hit. Climate change is recognized as a serious threat. This has been reinforced by one's in-groups and information networks. So um, clearly you're able to see uh, how things that are important to you are on the line. And this can understandably cause high levels of anxiety. Now this anxiety might be the start uh, of uh, you know, a, a career as a climate activist. But if that's just looking impossible, uh, and you, you can't just tell yourself a different story like deniers do, climate anxiety might end up leading to withdrawal instead, which can spill over into other aspects of your life as well. So for those whose emotional coping capacities have been compromised in some way, who lack social support for coping with those emotions, um, and who lack encouragement uh, and uh, self-efficacy uh, that can support engagement and collective action, intense levels of emotional distress are just gonna be so debilitating that they're gonna lead to withdrawal as, as a defensive response. Here's a big source of concern for me, and this really comes back to uh, um, um, the discussion of intersectionality uh, from, from a few slides ago. And that is the fact that marginalized groups women, children, black, brown, indigenous, LGBTQ groups are on the whole far more vulnerable to climate change. And it turns out these mental health impacts of climate change also disproportionately affect these same groups. Groups that are more likely also to lack their resources to cope and more likely to have other stressors in their lives. So here's yet another layer I think of climate injustice that deserves more attention than it's getting. Um, and it has political consequences because these groups uh, are groups with some of the biggest reasons to get engaged. Uh, and yet they might have the, they basically the least capacity to do so. Okay, the final um, uh, emotion cognition pathway of course is action. So this is what's supposed to happen among members of ostensibly the fittest species on the planet. 
we recognize a threat and we take action to eliminate it. Of course, only a small proportion of us fit into this group, at least all the time. Conceptually, action is most likely to result when, first of all, we have all of these pieces in place. So first of all, inappropriate threat response is triggered. Empathy for others is present, particularly beyond our own in-groups. Pro-climate behaviors are emotionally rewarded rather than associated with those negative emotions that we just discussed. And efficacy is present. So there's not a lot of empirical research that looks at pro-climate action exactly um, in quite this matter head on, but there's a, a number of empirical research trains that, uh, that take at least one or two elements of this and have provided support um, for these, uh, basically these four provisos. All right, so you put all that together and we have different emotional pathways, some of which lead us to action and some of which lead us to inaction. So here's our emotional trigger and we're exposed to that trigger. And if we are uh, basically unmoved by that trigger, we're inclined towards apathy. Um, if we are moved by that trigger and it is so alarming that um, we uh, prefer to uh, reject that story uh, and grasp onto uh, um, another story instead, then that's going to lend itself towards denial. And then finally, for those of us who uh, recognize the threat and do not deny it, uh, do not choose an alternative storyline, we're inclined towards a pretty high level of anxiety. Anxiety, of course, can lead to, to pro-climate action, but it can also lead to withdrawal. So if we take all of that together and we imagine how we can actually use it to intervene um, and to perhaps uh, help uh, uh, others navigate towards pro-climate action rather than uh, inaction, um, we can, uh, hang on a second. I think we can take heart in the fact that what is most unique about the human species is our, basically our self-awareness. Um, in other words, our reflexivity. And this is what gives us the capacity to change. Now herein lies the inescapably high levels of uncertainty as well associated with human behavior. Uh, when we're facing any systems involving people. But we should be very happy to have this uncertainty uh, because that reflexivity is the basis for social change and we are counting on it right now. So emotions are integral to e each of, of these processes. And given that, we can cultivate projects that basically enhance pro-climate action pathways by thinking about what can we do to trigger threat responses in others? Are you elevating the seriousness of climate change in your interactions with others? Do we talk about climate change in ways uh, and, and talk about the ways that it will affect us? What can you do to expand empathy maps, including your own empathy map? Maybe that looks like starting a community garden in a multi-ethnic neighborhood. Maybe it's something else. And how can we offer more emotional support to each other and make pro-climate action more emotionally rewarding and keep people out of, of that, that, that withdrawal pathway? And then here's a really big one. We need to empower each other. We need to start, start with yourself if needed, but then move on to others. The privileged among us might need to hand over the mic in order to make that happen. And then related to this, of course, is cultivating egalitarianism. So do we really need a leader? Maybe we can share the load of both leadership and mental tasks. There's ways I think that we can cultivate rewards to the team players rather than to the leaders, to the alphas. And of course, most importantly, you need to take care of yourself so that you can stay engaged um, as well, both as a researcher uh, and, and as, uh, as a pro-climate activist. And that's it. Thank you so much. <music>